Okay, so let us continue our discussion on normal forms. So, I in the last class I have defined in the last lecture we have seen the definition of the functional dependencies. Let me briefly recall this uh, important definition because we are going to spend considerable uh, amount of time understanding uh, this notion of functional dependencies. So, it basically um, says that uh, one set of attributes is actually functionally dependent on x that means, it is actually a function of x. So, you all know what is a function. So, the, the value of these attributes would uniquely determine the values of these attributes. Okay. So, that is all we are saying, but we are saying it in uh, elaborate manner here that if any instance r of r, if two tuples agree on these attributes of x, then they will also agree on the attributes of y, which is a different way of saying that it is a function. Okay. So, having said that we looked at several examples and in this class uh, I am going to continue uh, giving a couple of more uh, examples and then we will um, start looking at these functional dependencies in a little bit abstract way and then see uh, what are its uh, implications. Okay. So, in the last class we also talked about what are called trivial and non-trivial uh, functional uh, dependencies. So, you notice that if the right hand side attributes are a subset of the left hand side attributes, then this kind of a functional dependency x determines y will always hold on any scheme. What it says here is that if two tuples agree on x, then they will agree on y, but if y is a subset of x, so they are already agreeing on y. Okay. So, there is nothing. Uh, so, we call such, such kind of dependencies as trivial functional dependencies as they always hold. Now, if y is not a subset of x, we will call that as a non-trivial functional dependency. And then if x and y are actually completely, uh, they are disjoint, then we will call that as a completely non-trivial functional dependencies. So, most of the time we will be worried about non-trivial functional dependencies and we will see how exactly, what are the other various other things we will do with functional dependencies. Okay, before we proceed, here is a bit of a notational convention. We will use this low end alphabets A, B, C, D along with their subscripted versions like A subscript 1, B 1, C 1 like that to denote individual attributes. And then the, the alphabets on the high end, the X, Y, Z, Z, Y, X, W, U, V, etc those alphabets we will use for sets of attributes. So, the, these letters sorry, these letters we will use to stand for sets of attributes. That is why in the functional dependency we have always see, been using x determines y. Uh, uh, so, x is a set of attributes, y is a set of attributes. And if you have to talk about some individual attribute, then we will usually put it as a 1, a 2, b 1, b 2. C and C. We will use letters from the lower end of the alphabets. <coughs> this is just to make it uh, easier for us to remember. Now, let us look at some more examples. Consider this scheme prerequisite. We already have this in our scheme, on the institute uh, uh, scheme. We also have a lots of other relations in that scheme. If I leave it to you as an exercise to look at the functional dependencies in those things. Actually, in most of the other relations, the the uh, the functional dependency that holds would be key on the left hand side and the remaining attributes on the right hand side. You, you can uh, verify that, that. But this one, what about this one? Does there uh, does prerequisite functionally determine uh, course ID. So, prerequisite recall that prerequisite course is a course number, course ID is also a course number and we will have a row if some particular course is a prerequisite of some other course right. And so, there will be all such um, 
couples in this particular instance. Now, the question is if two rows agree on a prerequisite course, should they also agree on course ID in this uh, uh, relation? So, if they always agree in all instances of prerequisite relation, then we say that prerequisite course determines course ID. So, from the logical understanding of the domain, what do you feel about this? This is, this is not true, right? It is not true. So, a course might be prerequisite for many courses and so it might appear along with many other courses as tuples here. So, given the value of prerequisite, we will not be able to uniquely determine what is the course ID in, a, in general. Okay. What about the other way around? Does course ID determine prerequisite? Does course ID determine prerequisite? It is also not true because again a course may have many prerequisites actually. So, it is possible that no FDs hold on some schemes. So, do not be looking for schemes all uh, looking for functional dependencies uh, in all possible schemes. It is possible that there are uh, cases where no functional dependencies hold at all. Okay. Let us proceed. Uh, what about here student remember that this is the uh, example I told you that this is a example of a bad scheme and then we started all our discussion with this example. So, let us reconsider that example where we have roll number name sex department name. So, and office phone and HOD. So, what are all the assumptions here? The assumptions are that each depart each student belongs to a single department and each department is headed by a, a professor and the department has one office phone. So, these are the assumptions. So, under these assumptions, what is the key for this? What is the key for this key? What is the hesitation for telling me the key here? It is simple, right? We just chose to at, attach some more information with each student. So, that does not, uh, you know. Uh, uh, <coughs> affect the uh, you know the property that roll number uh, is the key for the relation. Roll number continues to be the key for this row because given the roll number we will be able to uniquely identify one row in this particular data set. Given the roll number we will be able to identify. So, there there would be two rows with same roll number it is a relation. So, roll number continues to be key. So, roll number since roll number is a key, so roll number determines all the other attributes, roll number determines. Notice one more thing here that we could actually write roll number determines department name as a separate FD and it will still be valid. Okay. And we because uh, you know instead of writing roll number name uh, determines name, roll number determines department ID etcetera. We now actually have uh, one FD which says roll number determines all the other attributes. And this kind of a thing uh, as we have uh, mentioned uh, right in the beginning that this kind of a thing always happens. If the left hand side is a key, if the left hand side is a key, key will always determine all the other attributes. Okay. So, that is a uh, functional dependency that always holds good in any scheme. Of course, if this key itself is all the attributes, then there is no possibility for the right hand side. That is what happened for a prerequisite uh, relation. Good. So, that is the uh, what about any other FDs that are existing here? 
any more remedies exist? Let us pick up some uh, attributes and then see whether they determine any other attribute. That means, if two rows agree on the on that attribute, then they have to agree on some other attribute, right. Can you see that something happening like that? In this set, roll number, name, sex, department, name, office phone, and HOD. Particularly, let us look at this department name. Let us look at department name. Department names are unique. We will not have in an institute, we will not have two departments of computer science, right. So, computer science and engineering the title of the name of the department is only one department. So, like that. So, the this this values for this if you focus on the values of this let us say if two, uh, two rows of this particular table agree on the value of the department name then what should they agree on what are the other attributes that they should agree on. What are the other attributes they should agree on? What is the what is the one more attribute that they should agree on at least huh? a HOD right. You cannot say that in in, in one tuple in computer science department has PSK I mean as Chandra is a HOD. And in some other uh, tuple, you cannot say that Krishna Sivalangam is a HOD, right? It will be inconsistent. So, if they, if two rows have Department of Computer Science in as under this column, then under the column HOD, they should have exactly one person. They cannot have two different values there. So they have to agree on it. And so is the case with office phone. So, is the case with office phone. If you mention office phone as one phone here and then some other phone in somewhere else, then we have doubt actually which is the actual phone, right. So, department name indeed functionally determines office phone and HOD. Well, good. Is there anything else? Do you think in one more thing or anything more? Let us look at this. They are just half a dozen of, of these attributes. So, okay, let me give you a hint. What about HOD on the right uh, on the left hand side? What is the policy of the institute of regarding HODs? Can some professor be a HOD for two departments? Will any professor will agree for that? One department itself is a big headache. So, I cannot be head of this department for two head, head, of, head departments. So, so, nobody will agree generally for the being a HOD for two departments. So, in general, a person is HOD for exactly one department. That is a reasonable assumption to make in this context. So, given that, so if you have HOD on the left hand side, what will you have on the right hand side? If if two uh, if two uh, tuples agree on HOD, then they will they will agree on department name and obviously phone. So HOD determines department name and office phone. In some in some places they may violate this policy and then make some board professor as HOD of two departments. So, it kind of depends on the policy of the institute. Luckily, we have a policy that each professor has had only one department. So, again it brings to focus the, the, the uh, fact that these function dependencies are actually knowledge about the domain that you are modeling. 
they are not they do not come from some uh, some thin air from somewhere they are knowledge about the domain that you are modeling and particularly they they cannot be inferred by just looking at data it has you have to look at the model you have to look at the domain now no other FTs hold and so we can <coughs> does office phone on the uh, office phone determine department name yeah actually that I think is uh, yeah so uh, given that uh, the, uh, the exact each uh, uh, department has so even office phone can be uh, thought of as some kind of a determiner for good so we can add that office phone now determines department name and also determines the code good so some other place also so this actually again brings to focus okay this is one thing this kind of you know determining the functional dependencies that hold on the on the domain by you know understanding the domain figuring out the key properties in the domain knowledge about the domain but there are some kind of functional dependencies which can actually be you know derived sort of mechanically from the given functional dependencies that is another uh, situation that uh, arises in this context and we will look at that. Given that some set of functional dependencies f hold on some scheme r, it, it turns out that we can actually do some logical inferences. I mean, logically, we can conclude that some other functional dependencies should always hold. Okay. I will give you an example for this. Say, uh, for instance, given that x determines y. And y determines z hold on some relation scheme. We can actually infer that x determines z must also hold. Why is this? If two rows agree on x and uh, because x determines y holds, they agree on y attribute values. And because y determines z hold, uh, holds in the given scheme, since they are agreeing on y attributes, they must also agree on z attributes. So that means basically if they assume if you assume that they agree on x attributes we will conclude that they agree on z attributes this is a simple uh, you know we can later of course give a nice name for this we can actually call this as a, some kind of a transitivity uh, property of the uh, functional uh, the determinants symbol well then there are going to be a lot more of these functional dependencies which are kind of you know mechanically uh, can be figured out given some set of functional dependencies we can actually figure out a lot more functional dependencies by this uh, process of uh, deriving them. So, then the question that comes up is how do we systematically obtain you know all such uh, new functional dependencies. And obviously, uh, the, we as designers are you know have uh, precious time. So, we will not be able to sit down and list down lots of things. Uh, we will list the crucial things and let let is there some algorithmic process by which we can actually obtain a, a lot of functional uh, dependencies. That is one question that comes, comes up. Of course, under the uh, we assume that unless all FDs are known, uh, a relation scheme is not kind of fully specified. So, uh, okay. In this context, let me define uh, a, a new kind of a uh, thing. We will call it uh, the entailment relation. It is a new name I am bringing in, a new symbol I will bringing in. This symbol actually is called the the turnstile symbol. So, we say that a functional set of functional dependencies f would 
entail some other functional dependency x determines y. So, it is read as read in multiple ways we say f entails x determines y or f logically implies x determines y like that we will read it. Now, the, the defining condition is that if in every instance r of some uh, scheme relation uh, of some relation scheme r capital R on which these functional dependencies f hold. So, if the left hand side functional dependencies hold then it is always the case that the right hand side functional dependency always also holds ok. If that is the case we say that then this right hand side functional dependency is logically implied by the left hand side functional dependency or left hand side functional dependencies entail the right hand side functional dependency ok. Now, we have already seen such an example. So, in the previous slide we have seen that if x determines y, y determines x hold on some scheme then if uh, then they will logically imply that x determines z holds ok. So, are there more such things? So, there was a researcher by name Armstrong who investigated this issue in the uh, early uh, you know uh, when, when the relational theory was getting uh, developed uh, in the 80s 90s <coughs> 19 and then uh, he came up with several inference rules for deriving new functional dependencies from a given set of functional dependencies. Ok. So, we will study them ok. Before we go one more notation we call this f plus f superscript plus as the closure of f which is the set of all functional dependencies x determines y that are logically implied by the given set of functional dependencies here ok. The set of all functional dependencies that are entailed by a given set of functional dependencies that is f plus. So, given f we talk about f plus which is the in some sense a logical closure of f ok. Now, so these uh, these logical inference uh, the inference rules that Armstrong uh, came up with they are called uh, Armstrong's inference rules and they are also known as Armstrong's axioms. Uh, we will look at them now ok. The first one is called the reflexive uh, rule which actually is, uh, is uh, you know always holds. So, so if f entails x determines y all x determines y such as y is a subset of x these are actually trivial functional dependencies. So, what it basically saying here is that whatever is the given set of functional dependencies we can always derive trivial functional dependencies out of it. So, these functional trivial depend, uh, functional dependencies are those which have their right hand side as a subset of the left hand side. So, trivial at this. Next one is what is called the augmentation rule. What this is is that suppose you are given a functional dependency x determines y then that would logically imply that a new functional dependency where you take some bunch of attributes and add them both to the left hand side and to the right hand side ok. So, we write them as x z uh, determines y z where z is some set of functional dependence some set of attributes uh, from R. Now, uh, so we use this notational convenience saying that instead of writing x union z we simply write it as x z here. You can also in our context of schemas it kind of makes sense because we are just going to write uh, these additional attributes concatenated with the old attributes ok. So, x z determines y z for some z which is a subset of R. So, this will uh, given that on some uh, on all any instance if x determines y holds 
then what we are saying is that uh, x z determines y z also uh, holds. But this is it's not very difficult to see this actually because anyway we are adding the same set of attributes on left hand side and right hand side. So if no now additionally uh, let us say uh, to, to argue that this is correct. So on two rows if x x z attributes agree then because we know that x determines y holds they will they have to agree on y attributes okay they have to agree on y attributes and since uh, you already uh, know that they agree on z attributes because they are uh, because on the left hand side z is also there so it's automatic that y z they agree on y z attributes okay if you have any questions please pause me because uh, i'm using a little bit new terms here uh, by now, I think you are comfortable in this term called uh, the two tuples agree on at attributes. That means they have the same corresponding values on the attributes. So, if they agree on xz attributes, they will agree on yz attributes given that x determines y. So, that is called the augmentation uh, rule. Then the next one is actually it is the transitive rule. And we have already uh, seen. I have given you this example. So, if x determines y holds, y determines z together hold on some scheme, then we can actually argue that they logically imply x determines z also holds. Okay. And uh, the the appropriate name to give for this is obviously transitive transitive rule. We call it transitive rule. Now, in addition to this, there are some other, uh, uh, there are actually three more rules, which are exactly, I, I will show you in the next slide that they are not exactly essential, but they are uh, nice to have them, you know. Uh, so, let us look at them actually. So, one of them is called the decomposition or projective rule. What this says is that, uh, given that x determines y z, see I want to now distinguish between two sets of attributes that is why I have written two symbols here y and z, y is a set of attributes, z is another set of attributes. x determines y z is given, then it logically implies x determines y holds. Okay. So, what we are basically saying here is that we are only choosing some subset of the right hand side and then claiming that that function dependency holds, which is actually very obvious because if two um, uh, given that this this happens that that means any two rows if they agree on x they will agree on y z is given, they will obviously agree on a subset of y z because they already are agreeing on the entire y z. So, they will agree on some subset of y z this y is a subset of y z. Remember this we are we will continue to use this notation the two two sets we write them uh, together is union. Okay. So, this is called decomposition rule which basically uh, allows us to kind of drop some attributes on the right hand side uh, and then derive new uh, functional dependencies from the given functional dependency. Now, the the reverse of this is what is called the union rule. If you are able to uh, if you are able to do that, then obviously we can do this. So, if x determines y holds, x determines z holds, then we might as well combine combine that together and then write that x determines y z. Okay. Given that x determines y and x determines z hold, that means if two tuples agree on x they are going to agree on y, they are going to agree on z. So, we might as well write that x determines y z, which is in some sense the inverse of the above rule, the projective rule. So, that is why it is called union or additive rule. Now, here is a uh, one more rule called pseudo transitive rule 
what this says is that if x determines y and some w y is determined z is given, then you can derive w x determines z, w x determines z. It is not very actually difficult to see this. So, if you start off with w x determines w x, if they agree on w x, then uh, you know uh, since they agree on x, they will be agree on y and since uh, w is already there. So, if they agree on w y and it is given that they agree on z. So, you can see that if they agree on w x, they will actually agree on z. You can actually formally prove that by using, I will show you, uh, I, will, I will take one of these examples and then show how exactly we can uh, so called derive them using. In fact, you can what we can show is that all these 4, 5, 6 are not really necessary. The, these that the fact that this is logically implied by this can in fact be proved by using 1, 2, 3 itself. Okay. We will see that I will show you for I think I will show you for this at the table and I will leave it as an exercise for you to show the other two. Okay. So, basically what it uh, what is happening here is that there are some functional dependencies that can be in some sense logically derived from the given set of functional dependencies and now we are finding that uh, uh, this researcher Armstrong has uh, postulated or given uh, certain rules. And what we actually find interesting about this whole thing is that these first three rules on A T are in fact necessary and also sufficient to get hold of all the functional dependencies that logically hold on a given set of given a particular set of functional dependencies in order to get hold of f plus these on a t this uh, flexive rule augmentation rule transitive rule are necessary and sufficient we will actually uh, make that uh, statement elaborate we will elaborate on that statement Good. Before we proceed to that, let us take rule 5, uh, uh, rule 4, 5, 6 actually are not really necessary. We will take rule 5 and then see um, that we can actually prove that using 1, 2, 3 alone. So, let me take this as a small exercise as to also illustrate to you as to how you, if you are given some, some, uh, some entitlement relation like this, how do you actually prove it? So, you prove it by writing down these given things on uh, into uh, different lines as given and then start writing all the inferences uh, what can be. So, now given x determines y, x determines z, we can use the augmentation rule on, on this one and then simply augment. Uh, uh, augment x on both sides, augment it with x on both sides. So, x union x is x itself and x union y is x y. So, we will get a new thing called x determines x x y. Now, take the other one x determines z and augment it with y, x y determines y z, z y. Now, now that you have x determines x y, x y determines z y, use the transitive rule and then you will get this x determines z, z y or y z. It does not matter whether you write it y z or z y because union is committed. So, what is the rule here saying x determines y, x determines z uh, logically implies x determines y z and we will be able to prove that x determines by making use of rule 1, 2, 3, reflexive, oh sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, rule augmentation rule 2 times and the transitive rule once, rules 2, 3 we have been able to use and then prove this. 
So, try this as an exercise for the other two uh, rules also 4, 6 also you will be able to uh, prove them using just 1, 2, 3 alone. Okay, but it is kind of useful to have this 4, 5, 6 as you know shortcut uh, rules because every time you want to use this nice uh, you know uh, rule called the projective rule or the union rule, you do not have to again uh, you know use 1, 2, 3 to kind of first derive them. So, well let us keep them as 4, 5, 6 as useful shortcuts, but theoretically speaking they are not really necessary. Okay, so what is the story so far? The story so far is that normally functional dependencies have to be determined by the designers. Okay, but there are some kind of functional dependencies which can be, you know, logically derived from the given set of functional dependencies. In order to understand this, we have defined a uh, uh, notion called logical implication among the sets of functional dependencies ok and we call that as entailment ok. And in that after we define this entailment relation we have now seen that there are three uh, rules called the reflexive rule, augmentation rule and transitive rule using which we can derive other functional dependencies. Now the interesting question that comes up is that are these rules arbitrarily chosen? Are they enough? Are they you know good? First thing is are they good and are they enough? So, this, this also can be called as sound and complete inference rules. So, what Armstrong has not uh, shown is that he not only postulated these three rules, but he has also shown that these rules are what are called sound and complete in the sense that Supposing I define this f underscore uh, under, I mean super, uh, subscript uh, w a for starting for Armstrong's axioms as the set of all functional dependencies x determines y that can actually be derived from f using Armstrong's axioms. Now that we have Armstrong's axioms, we clearly understood them. So you know also how to derive a new functional dependency given a set of functional dependencies. So let's call that set of all functional dependencies that can be put derived from f using Armstrong's axioms as let us give it a new name f underscore double a. Now, for soundness what we are claiming here is that f double a is in is in fact subset of f plus. What is f plus? f plus is the closure that is the set of all functional dependencies that can be logically derived from f. So, whatever the Armstrong's axioms derive are in fact correct ones, I mean they are in fact members of f plus. So, every new functional dependency x determines y derived from a given set of functional dependencies f using the Armstrong's axioms is such that f indeed entails that. So, this is if you show this, this is called soundness and our correctness of these rules. The other one is called the completeness. What this says is that given any functional dependency that is so what the actually what this says is f plus is a subset of f underscore w. That means given any functional dependency x determines y that is logically implied by f that means is a, is a member of f plus. Okay. It can in fact be derived from f using Armstrong axioms. This is a surprising fact, actually, right. So, if you are able to show these two things, then we have made really very strong statement about this Armstrong axioms that these rules are enough. Do not look around for new rules, these rules are enough, okay. So, that is very nice. Uh, property of this Armstrong axioms. So, in the next lecture I will actually uh, prove uh, that the soundness and completeness of this Armstrong axioms indeed hold. Okay. Now, 
there is a nice picture that I have here to illustrate this thing that this is f and this is f plus ok. So, basically derive using double a. So, what we are soundness what claims is that whatever you derive using Armstrong's axioms falls within f plus it does not go outside that is the sound. Now, the other one is that taken some something from here you take some functional dependency uh, that is a member of f plus which is it can in fact be derived using f that is what the completeness claims f plus is subset of so, it is it will be interesting to uh, prove these two facts we will see them in the next lecture ok. I, I suggest you reflect on this uh, two interesting properties of Armstrong's axioms before you come to the next class actually try out uh, uh, some uh, schemes in fact you have all you know some uh, derived some schemes. Uh, so, on them you try to figure out what are the functional dependencies that hold between that figures and look at them from this angle ok. Good.